Welcome everyone to tonight's presentation. My name is Marisa Gomez. I'm the Community Education and Collaboration Manager for the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. The museum is honored to be joined tonight by our partners in natural history and partners for tonight's program, Watsonville Wetlands Watch and UC Santa Cruz's Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History. Uh, we're here tonight to celebrate the life and legacy of Richard John Gurney, a local legend and pioneer in the field of scientific taxidermy. Um, and as we'll come uh, to learn more about tonight, Mr. Gurney hailed from Watsonville, California, um, where he interacted with the natural world originally inhabited by the Mutsun speaking people. And today these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsun tribal band. The Amamutsun are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamutsun Land Trust. Tonight, we will be hearing from several people and organizations who knew, worked with, shared and continue to share the work of Mr. Gurney with the community. And we also want to hear from you uh, throughout the program. Please share your thoughts, questions, and memories using the chat function. And please take a moment uh, now again to adjust to your messages are sent to, um, choosing the, the option for everyone. And let us know, where do you first remember connecting with taxidermy specimens? And for me, this was kind of a hard one to answer when I was first thinking about it. I know that I was exposed to taxidermy growing up, but really what comes to mind is when I first started volunteering at the museum where I now work, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, um, about a decade ago now, and just having the opportunity to um, engage with the specimens more viscerally. Um, that's really what's uh, what's stuck with me. So I'm grateful for those um, experiences. And I'd love to hear your experiences. Where did you first connect uh, with taxidermy. Marisa, so I'm gonna jump in really quickly and say that some folks are having trouble with the chat being disabled. Oh yeah, let me, um, that's another thing that we've got to fix on these things. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, and okay. thank you for pointing that out. There's a lot of settings that are not going our way today because it's been a while since I've done one of these. Um, so let me just take a moment. Kathleen, why don't you tell us while I fix this? So I was trying to think about this too. I'm from the outer San Francisco Bay Area. And I think one of the first, the first place I really remember interacting with taxidermy was at the Lindsay Wildlife Museum, which is now called the Lindsay Wildlife Experience, which was an incredible place where you could bring injured wildlife. You could see like um, captive wildlife that had been like, you know, was healing or recovering from injuries on display. And then you could also see a bunch of different animals that were taxidermied there. Um, and seeing all these different ways of interacting with vultures, especially blew my mind as a little kid. Thank you for sharing. I wasn't listening to any of that because I've been reading all of these things. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I heard vultures. <laughs> um, okay, I fixed the chat and thank you all for your patience. <laughs> okay. So um, now I'm going to let everyone else who is a panelist today turn on your video so you can, everyone uh, tuning in can see all of the fantastic people who are joining us um, tonight. And I'm going to introduce everyone. So let me see. Oh, there they are. All of these great faces. Perfect. Um, so I want to start by introducing um, Kathleen, who already graciously has stepped in to save the day. Um, so my colleague Kathleen Aston is the collections manager for the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, and Kathleen's going to get us started tonight um, sharing the history of taxidermy uh, and a little bit of uh, Mr. Gurney's impact on the museum. But before I hand things over to her, we're also joined by Chris Lay, the administrative director of the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History, who has spent many years partnering with Mr. Gurney and will share insights about his life and unique techniques. And so, Chris, thank you for all of your efforts in putting this together and being here tonight. Uh, we're also joined by Jonathan Pilch and Stephanie Rios uh, from Watsonville Wetlands Watch, which is a local environmental education organization that connects Mr. Gurney's local Watsonville community and beyond with nature through his specimens and their many amazing programs. And Jonathan and Stephanie, uh, thank you both so much for being here as well. Um, and then we've got a couple of esteemed honored guests, um, including Mitch Phillips, 
who uh, you see here, who we're going to bring at some point, um, Mitch, I'll so, say more about Mitch uh, later, but he is the future of Gurney's freeze dye taxidermy and also worked very closely um, with Mr. Gurney in recent years. And so um, we're grateful to have his perspective. And then also not on video right now, we've got um, the uh, Kodiga family who um, have been very close with Mr. Gurney for many years. And we're going to hear a few words from them too. So um, thank you all for being a part of sharing this story and honoring Mr. Gurney's legacy. And I'm going to hand things over to Kathleen now. I'm going to be in charge of sharing screen. So hopefully I don't further disappoint you all um, tonight with this. There we go. Okay. Take it away, Kathleen. All right, cool. Um, so I like that Marisa asked us about our personal connections to taxidermy, understanding the context of how significant um, Richard Gurney's legacy in taxidermy is, is something I didn't really encounter until I began working at the museum, although I saw a lot of his specimens on display when I would come here when I was a kid. Um, and so I think it's really cool, his legacy and his impact on the world of taxidermy. And we really wanted to ground this discussion in a little bit of the history um, of taxidermy as a practice for that added context. Although um, I know a lot of folks who are in this uh, panel and uh, in the audience probably have a lot more direct experience with taxidermy from me. So I look forward to hearing people's backgrounds in that regard. Um, so taxidermy from about 1820 is uh, a combination of the Greek words for arranging and skin, speaking directly to this practice of taking sort of the skin or the outer parts of an animal and arranging them around some sort of armature or structure to make a sort of display piece um, that people can engage with. Um, you go to the next slide, Marisa. Thank you. Um, as like a quick kind of distinction that I think is important, there's kind of two main types of taxidermy that you'll normal, normally see associated with the Natural History Museum um, today or historically, and those are study skins and mounts. And so study skins, like you can see here to the left side, these sort of bird popsicle type things, as they sometimes get lovingly called, are um, specimens that have been prepared to be preserved for the explicit purpose of conducting research. So as you're preparing them, you're trying to make sure that they can be like, you know, easily storable, you can tuck a lot of them into one space, you're preserving um, specific significant features. These are the kinds of specimens that you often see when you see those like gorgeous shots of big museums showing off their hundreds and hundreds of like historic specimens and drawers and drawers of birds. Um, the other type is the mount. Um, so a taxidermy mount can be like, you know, sitting, standing, flying, doing whatever kind of thing that animal can do. And it is usually made for more explicitly the purpose of display. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, Marisa, we'll see an example of kind of one of the origin, the origins of this type of display. Um, some people trace the history of taxidermy, you know, thousands of years into the past um, to practices like ancient Egyptian mummification, but really sort of this kind of scientific Western practice of taxidermy for scientific study and display has its origins more in the 15 and 1600s in Europe. Um, where you have these big colonial expeditions going all over the world, exploring different kinds of things, taking specimens back to Europe and putting them on display in these immense curio cabinets that would just flood people with experiences of all these strange and unique and interesting objects. Um, and you can see up top here in this illustration, which is from, um, I think, 1599 in Italy, um, you can see an illustration of a taxidermied crocodile. Um, and I always like including this picture because it's a uh, reminds me of the, the oldest known taxidermy specimen we have uh, still in existence from this tradition is from the 1500s and it's been hanging from the ceiling of an Italian, it's a crocodile that's been hanging from the ceiling of an Italian church for hundreds of years. Um, anyway, so some cool photos, thank you for the slide change. Um, so as museums have evolved from curio cabinets until what you can find as your present day natural history museum, a lot of things changed. Um, one of those things was the style of displays. You start to see more systematic and kind of sort of orderly displays. Um, you also start to see these immersive diorama displays. Um, this was something that um, gained in popularity in the 1800s, in part because it became a lot easier um, to do taxidermy that was going to be well preserved and more lifelike with the introduction of certain chemical practices like arsenic treatment of specimens that made things um, get eaten by pests a lot less. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, you have this immense popularity of these like big displays. A lot of them are very charismatic animals that have been credited with um, influencing the history of conservation movements. Um, and you have all these in-house taxidermists at different museums. So that last photo was the Smithsonian. Um, and this one is also, it's a taxidermist workshop in the 1880s. 
Um, and so I mentioned that introduction of like, you know, the technology of preserving things with arsenic that kind of ushers in in the 1840s or so this sort of notion of a golden age of taxidermy where you have um, taxidermists in many, like in, in almost every town in the US, some historical reports say, and then you have these bigger taxidermists um, in, within housed within museums, um, which is not a practice we see as much of anymore. Um, that changed for a couple of reasons. Uh, well, let's stay on the slide for just a minute. Um, there's like a lot of complex reasons why you see some of these sort of changes. Um, a lot of these bigger museums were having these like big, epic, big game hunting displays that they would fill up their exhibit halls with. And then those things got full. Um, you also have this change where color photography allows people in, and other emerging technologies allow people to engage with taxidermy or with animals that otherwise were represented by taxidermy in different ways people are having more and more leisure time. And so they're able to go and see some of these things. Um, and yeah, and then you just, you run out of space. Um, but uh, despite that, so you, you get the golden age of taxidermy starts to peter out a little bit more towards World War II in the 1940s. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, just because of these changes in like, you know, the sort of museum world doesn't mean that there was not a lot of popularity from folks, uh, you know, outside of the kind of more formal profession. Um, obviously, you have a lot of people who are preserving trophies, which is a very, you know, old practice. Um, you also have widespread popularity of like at home taxidermy style projects. And also there's a siren outside my window, so I hope that isn't distracting y'all. Um, and so this is an example of this really amazing series of taxidermy, mail away taxidermy pamphlets that we have in our collections that are from the 1930s. Um, you also have signs of this popularity in things like a Boy Scout merit badge for taxidermy, which was from about 1911 until the early 1950s. Um, and it was actually apparently a Boy Scout merit badge in pursuit of a Boy Scout merit badge that Richard Gurney made one of his first taxidermy projects. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I wanted to point out that like against this like larger, you know, context of taxidermy, um, historically taxidermy has always been a big important part of our museum. Um, you see a lot of these articles about Laura Hecox's early collection having shells and curios. You see these beautiful shell cabinets. Um, but if you go to the next slide, um, you can see an example of an incredibly striking taxidermy parrot that was from the Laura Hecox collection and article talking about how she was regularly in the practice of taking eggs, nests, and other specimens, um, sharing them with the public through her museum or like the county fair. So not just birds, but taxidermy in general has been really important for us historically for a long time. Um, if you go to the next slide, Marisa, um, and, and with that, we've seen some transitions in our own museum, which Marisa, I think we'll talk a little bit more in terms of like what kinds of things are on display and how we display them. Um, but a really important part across different kinds of animals and different kinds of displays of our public display taxidermy collections and the public displays, you know, the, the mounts that we have um, in storage for different pop-ups and exhibits are Richard Gurney specimens. Um, we're especially excited that we have specimens um, like this frog, or if you go into the next slide, um, like this octopus that showcase the um, sort of, you know, way that freeze dry taxidermy, which is the important technological innovation that Gurney was a pioneer of, is better able to preserve soft bodied specimens and things that don't have a lot of this like same kind of rigid interior structure, um, like sort of those big game bison in the earlier slides. Um, so I think that Chris now is gonna come on and talk a little bit more about the innovation of freeze dried taxidermy um, and share with you some photos of uh, Richard Gurney's studio and process. So Thanks. Chris, if you wanna, yeah. Uh, Marisa, could you just leave me without, could you not share the screen just so people can see behind me for a sec? Um, uh, hi, everybody. It's great that you're here. I'm excited um, to be doing this. Um, so I'm Chris Lay. I am the administrative director of the Norris Center for Natural History, which is UC Santa Cruz's Natural History Museum. Um, all the specimens behind me were done by Richard Gurney and they are viewed and used by thousands of students and community members every year um, and we use them for internships and classes and research and public events um, and they make up a big part of what we do. Uh, I was fortunate enough to visit um, Richard at his shop often over the last 15 years. I got to know him, I got to learn some things from him, uh, and I want to just tell you some stories that I remember from my time with him 
And what I learned about his revolutionary form of taxidermy, it was a thing he invented. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's really fun to see this, the stories come out in, this, in the chat. So appreciate you keep doing that. Um, so I have to start by, before we start the slides, by just telling you how I first met him. Um, uh, and basically I had to learn that he doesn't go by Richard. Um, and I had to learn that uh, his name really was John and his close friends <laughs> called him John. And I am not sure about the derivation of how that all happened, but for months I would call him because I had specimens that I wanted to bring him and his answering machine would pick up and he'd, you know, and I'd leave a message and I'd just say, hey, Richard, this is Chris. I'm from UC Santa Cruz. I want to bring you some specimens. And I just kept not getting through to him. And finally, in desperation, I asked around and somebody said, oh, you just need to leave a message and say, hi, John, this is Chris from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and I tried that and immediately um, he picked up. Um, and that's when I first started really getting to know him. Um, and the reason he did that, I found out later, um, was that he, he got tired of telemarketers um, and he, I think he got tired of people uh, wanting to freeze dry their pets. And he, he would say something like, I don't do members of the family. Um, and, uh, but once I got to know him, I got to visit him at his shop. And so you can, you can, you can share the slides now, Marisa. So many of you might recognize this if you're especially in Watsonville. I believe this is just still there, even though um, uh, he's not. Um, but yeah, in the middle of downtown Watsonville was uh, Gurney Freeze Dry Taxidermy. And I was just blessed. A, a, a colleague and friend of mine, Joe Miller, shared some photos that he took. And he got a picture of John, Richard, um, uh, coming to his shop. And he, that's how he came. He always would ride his bike and I'd always see his bike in the shop. Um, and so there he is going into his shop and stepping into his, into his shop. You can, you can go to the next slide, Marisa. Uh, it was really like stepping back in time. Um, and there were so many things to notice in here. And the, I remember the first time going in and just, you know, just being a kid at a candy shop and just looking at so many things. And I think I spent probably 45 minutes just in the, in the front room, just looking at things and he would come out and talk to me and I'd ask him questions. Um, and a lot of what was in the front was, were, were specimens and, you know, kind of traditional specimens that I might see a traditional taxidermist uh, do, but there were a few things that really like stood out to me. And one of them was on the wall in the back. I don't know whether you can see the no smoking sign um, in the back, but go ahead and flip to the next slide. Back there was a chameleon that was like perched on a, on a branch. And you can see that chameleon's tongue sticking all the way out. And when I saw that, I realized, okay, that's not something you see in a typical taxidermy shop. Like how in the heck did somebody do that? Um, and like that really just uh, got me curious. Um, uh, and like I was, I was definitely taken in and I wanted to learn more. And so here's another, here's another picture from the front room. You can see all the specimens and you can see John sitting there at his desk. Um, go ahead and flip to the next one. Uh, you know, off to the side were all these reptiles, and I was just amazed that you could taxidermy reptiles, um, and then all these beautiful mammals and birds hanging on the wall. It was really just amazing. And eventually, I got to know him well enough that he felt comfortable with letting me go in the back, and the back was where he did all his his work and so many things were in the back and so many things to look at in the back. Uh, and, you know, he had 
specimens he'd done on the wall. And then he had specimens he was working on, on his workbench and on his top of his freeze dryer. Um, and these are just some that happened to be there when someone took this photograph. These macaws are obviously really striking. And I find it quite amusing that um, they're both perched on local manzanita, um, uh, which is just kind of fun, which, you know, uh, John would find that he would, the, part of the art was finding things that he could perch things on. And they're just so beautiful that that, that manzanita uh, trunk right there is really striking just as much as the macaws. The coyote like um, is amazing and just so, alive looking and you always knew that you were looking at a, one of Gurney's mammal specimens because he often had to do them sitting because he couldn't fit large mammals in his freeze dryer. So you'd, the coyote was about as big as uh, he could get in his freeze dryer, but it had to be sitting. So. Um, and Chris, I just wanted to chime in and say that um, there's someone in who's attending named Diana who just said that those are her macaws. <laughs> so we might have that happen where people notice their own. If you notice your specimen um, at any point, please let us know in the chat and we'll point it out. That's so fun. Oh, great. <laughs> That's awesome. You can Is go that the goshawk in the back too, or are you going to get there's to a it? There's a goshawk <laughs> in the back left. Yeah, there's a bunch your of favorite. things in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so go ahead, flip to the next slide. Um, there were so many things to look at in the back and little things um, as well as big things. And there's John sitting at his desk in the back um, with, and there's a bunch of animals all over the desk. And uh, a few things just on the right here, like that close up of that squirrel and that duck, and you might not recognize what's on the right there, but those are actually freeze dried mushrooms. So he could freeze dry many, many different things. Um, and they were just really amazing. And then in the lower right, there were little jar lids of homemade eyes that he made himself. And the process of him making the eyes was just astonishing in how both simple and perfect um, it was. Um, and so it was just amazing to watch him do that. Go ahead to the next slide. And of course, it was him working back here that was really what we came to see was, um, and so I would come in and I would ask him questions while he was working on specimens and I would bring him specimens and occasionally I brought him students um, and he would teach us how to do things. Um, uh, and he was surrounded by his tools and stacks of cutout magazine pictures of wildlife and specimens on the walls and his freezer, his giant freezer with the big freeze dryer in it. And the pump was always going in the background. Next slide. So when I think of John, um, oh, I guess here's another one of him working just on some specimens. Um, uh, honestly, one of the things that I was most intrigued with him was just watching him with his hands and how he just could just caress the specimens and like preen that he would always be preening the feathers and he'd always be making little micro adjustments. Um, and he was just so delicate with his hands. It was really amazing. So when I think of John, go ahead to the next slide. When I think of John, I think of like four ways to like really, the way he showed up for me, go back one. Um, Sorry, I think there's a bit of the delay with the slides, so I'll keep that in mind. Okay, so he was first and foremost a naturalist, um, and here's a picture of him. He went fishing, and we'll hear from some family friends that uh, they went they went out fishing a lot <laughs> out to Yellowstone and um, the Yellowstone area, and you know that really grounded him in in just a love of the natural world and just getting out there and you know, he taxidermied things when he was young, he loved butterflies. Um, and he would always, we invited him up to the North Center a couple of times, and he was just completely awestruck by our butterfly collection, and always wondering how the heck we got them so perfectly uh, preserved, um, which was always amusing <laughs> to hear him say that because he was so good at it himself. Um, but yeah, he was a naturalist. Uh, and, you know, I connected with him over being a naturalist. Go ahead, next slide. He was also an artist and his art, 
involved lots of things like making eyes for all his specimens, painting the bills and feet of his specimens. Uh, since these discolored when, when they dried out. Um, but really his artistic genius was in posing animals. And that's what you had to do before you stuck those animals in the freeze dryer. And so uh, to the right there, that coyote um, has been posed before, it is, it's, before it's going into the freeze dryer. And his, his medium in posing these animals was his just unbelievable use of wire. Like he was just a master of using wire to support specimens up in particular postures. Um, and it was just amazing to watch him use wire to like get specimens mounted. And, you know, look at looking at this mouse in the lower left, like he could make these positions. They're just so lifelike and they're just, they're just ready to like, yeah, they're, they're so expressive. It was just really, really amazing um, uh, to see that art. So he was an artist. And uh, I think we're gonna try this and we'll see how this works. Our next slide is actually a video of him mounting, or of actually posing, I'll just let it go. Can I speak at the same time? I don't know whether you can hear the hear the audio, but that's the that's the pump going in the background of his freeze dryer, and he's working with a rattlesnake. Remember, it's not alive, but he's just using really really simple tools, uh, cardboard and little pieces of wire and a thumbtack to just beautifully pose the head of this snake. Just. It was just magical to watch him. Really to where you can see it, huh? Got a little thumbtack. What he's it's gonna tack it down to his board. Just delicately placing it there. So I have no idea whether that worked for everybody. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, but we can share that link with you and you can watch it on YouTube if you want. Um, and we have a couple other videos that we could share as well. Uh, just amazing in, in the simplicity and in, in genius and in little inventions on how he was able to pose things. But that was his true art was in posing things. Um, but he was also an inventor. Um, and that's really something that, I mean, I just feel so blessed to have been in, in the presence of someone who invented something like from scratch. No one taught him how to do all these things. Um, uh, he created and perfected an entirely new way of doing taxidermy that has a, like, um, enormous benefits, like enormous advantages over traditional taxidermy. Um, uh, and just to give you a little background, he was a student um, at uh, Cal State Humboldt. And I think that was where he was first exposed to the fact that we could freeze dry things and we, we freeze dried small things to look at them. So I think he was freeze drying bacteria. Um, and it was it was him who really had the idea, well, what if we try freeze drying bigger things? Um, what would that, what would happen there if we tried that? Um, and he began experimenting when he went to UC Berkeley with freeze dry taxidermy. And 
one of his professors got a job at the Smithsonian and that professor told the Smithsonian that, hey, I've got this student who's really getting good at freeze dry taxidermy. Why don't you invite him out? And he came out and worked for the Smithsonian in Washington for 10 years um, and helped make their life in the sea exhibit as well as some other things. I'm not exactly sure how many things, but some of those things may still be on display. And he like designed and created their whole freeze dry system, which is still there at the Smithsonian. Um, eventually he got frustrated with that job and quit um, and actually go back to that same slide again. Um, uh, and he quit and uh, he came back to Watsonville. And in the early seventies, he started his shop in Watsonville. And I'm not exactly sure when he built this, whether it was before or after the Smithsonian, but he built all his tools, including um, his freeze dryer. And the freeze dryer is amazing. And this is a picture of it. Um, uh, when I asked him how the freeze drying method worked, like we had long conversations about it. Um, and what he first started me out doing, which I didn't expect at all, was that he handed me a potato and uh, I was like, what, why are you handing me a potato? Um, and he said, this is a potato that I freeze dried like decades ago. And it was just sitting on his counter, sitting on his bench. And it just looked like a potato. <laughs> it had not rotted. It had not shrunk. It just was a potato. It was just a little bit lighter than a regular potato. Um, and he was just showing me like when you freeze dry something, the structure of that thing stays. It doesn't like shrivel or wrinkle or just completely collapse. You can keep the structure of something. And that was really his genius was realizing that that can happen. Now, the way you do that is complicated. You have to freeze something solid and then you have to put it in a chamber and pull a vacuum on the chamber and when you pull a vacuum on a frozen object, something magical happens. That frozen water in that object does what's called sublimates. It turns directly from a solid to a gas. Um, and if you keep that vacuum going, you sublimate out the water. And if you put in the back of your uh, chamber, your evacuated chamber, a condenser, a way to like, get that water vapor out of the chamber, you can slowly take the water out of the specimen um, and it will dry out and magically it keeps its form. It might shrink a little bit and, you know, he learned about all the different things. Um, I mean, every kind of critter had a slightly different way it freeze dried and he knew exactly what would happen when he put it in the freeze dryer. And, you know, a big Coyote might take a couple months in the freeze dryer to fully dry out, or a little hummingbird would only take a few weeks. Um, but that's that's how he did it. And uh, many and once you get the water out of a specimen, uh, it resists decomposition. It is amazing. His specimens. Uh, in his shop, I would ask him like, how old, when did you make that? He's like, oh, maybe the 1970s. Um, and it still looked fine. You know, it wasn't like moth eaten or anything. It just looked fine. Um, and our specimens here are doing the same. Um, so they really resist decomposition. And so I see somebody asking in the chat, and I'm finally getting to your question. When you freeze dry, do you leave all the internal organs in place? Yes. Uh, in most cases, he would leave everything in there. So all the specimens behind me um, are, all the insides are still on the inside, including the eyes. And he would make eyes and just stick them right over top of the old eyes or the, the actual eyes. So um, there were so many other genius, ingenious inventions. So you can go to the next slide, uh, Marisa. Um, and here are just, a few just amazing things he would do just again, like posing was his, his real art, but he would make the eyes. Um, and I just imagining what it took to make this bobcat, like holding this hair, 
just amazing. Um, so uh, I will stop there for now. And um, I'd like to uh, pass it on to our next speaker. There we go. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I thought that I knew what freeze dries taxidermy was, but I don't think I really did. So that was really, really helpful. And the part about the eyes, uh, you ended on a mind blowing moment. I'm going to start looking for them. Do you think that you can see them? If you look, look close enough, can you see the, the remnants of eyes behind? I doubt it. Like, I bet he was good about covering them up. But the interesting thing about his, his, uh, the eyes that he made, I mean, we could talk more if, if in questions and answers, if people want to ask about how he made the eyes, we can talk about that. And Mitch knows a little more than I do, but, um, they're not glued in or anything. He just stuck them in and he just like put the eyelids over the top and the bottom. And then he was done. Like yeah. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and well, he would like, he would freeze the whole specimen first and then he'd get it out. And then he just like use his hands to like, to like warm up the island, <laughs> just put the eyes like, right. it was wild. Man. Well, yeah. So, they, so we do have with us here, um, uh, our friend Mitch Phillips, um, who is, uh, was an apprentice of Mr. Gurney for several years, um, and it has uh, overtaken, has taken over uh, free, uh, Gurney's Free Dye Taxidermy um, and has incorporated it into his existing taxidermy business. And um, we're just really excited to have Mitch here to share some stories about his time working with Mr. Gurney. Um, I know that there are many, many wonderful memories that you have uh, with him, Mitch, and we'd love to just uh, hear a few. So thank you for being here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. I, it, that's good for me because I, <laughs> it, it's very rare that I know how to work this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we're all, we're all doing our best today. <laughs> all right. So my name is Mitch, Mitch Phillips. I own First Impressions Taxidermy. I am a taxidermist. Uh, I learned traditional taxidermy, uh, let's say probably 10 years ago from a gentleman that um, he was on his out too. And so he needed some help. And the gentleman that taught me taxidermy passed away from cancer. Long story short, you know, once I learned it and I was doing it when he passed away, I didn't have anybody else to go to. <laughs> so there was a lot of, uh, trial and error, which the gentleman that taught me taxidermy he learned, he was self-taught, and I mean literally self-taught. He learned from books. He learned just like John did. He learned by just getting out there and doing it, you know? And um, that's the crazy thing about taxidermy is taxidermy is, yes, you can go to school for it. There, there are a few schools throughout the country that you can go to school and do taxidermy. But the people like myself or like Chris that learned or, or were able to meet people like John and change our lives in taxidermy, you, you don't meet that kind of person, right? Like it, it, we're in a career that is a dying art. And I'm going to tell you this, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that especially myself, I don't consider myself an artist, or I, I never considered myself an artist until recently. You know, I, I was a welder for 20 years. I'm 46 years old. I was a welder for 20 years. And now to do taxidermy, like, <laughs> last thing I ever thought I'd be doing. <laughs> but the great thing about it is the gentleman that got me into taxidermy also led me to the the turning point of meeting John and meeting Richard or John um like Chris said you know there there's a lot of people that knew John as Richard Richard Gurney freeze dry taxidermy I mean you can 
see the sign behind me. It says Gurney Freeze Dried Taxidermy. Um, but his name was Richard, right? Uh, his born, his, his biblical name, whatever you want to call it, was Richard. But I was introduced to him as John. And for the longest time, I always called him Mr. Gurney until he said, you know, you can just call me John. And the Chris wasn't lying. The, the only people that were able to call him John were his close friends, relatives, whatever, you know. Um, you, you, you had to be kind of close to him to be able to call him John. With that being said, John was a specimen of his own. He, they broke the mold on that guy. I'm going to tell you that. Like, Chris touched, he, he touched everything that I wanted to say. Not only was he an inventor, like, th this guy used to make his own eyes. I don't know if you, if anybody out there understands taxidermy the way I do as a taxidermist, but making your own eyes is unheard of. It's unheard of. But this guy did it for every specimen that he worked on. He made his own eyes. That's unbelievable. Like that is a true testament to the inventor that this guy was and, and the thought process that this gentleman had. Um, you know, for me, <laughs> there were a few things that, that he taught me that <clears throat> I'll never forget straightening wire. You know, as a taxidermist, we use wire a lot. And Chris touched on it. He touched on how this guy could use wire and, and make something look, once it's wired up, make it look like <laughs> nothing you'd ever seen before, you know? And um, John taught me how to straighten out wire. And the day that he taught me that, I used to buy straight wire and it cost a fortune. And then he showed me how to straighten wire. I was like, duh, <laughs> like that's the easiest, dumbest thing I've ever, like, why didn't I never think of that? But it's the truth. Like it takes a vice and it takes a drill and you straighten wire. And anybody that's worth their salt that has to use a lot of wire, if you want to know how to straighten wire, please get in touch with me. I'll show you how to straighten wire. <laughs> the other thing with John is <clears throat> Chris was right. He he didn't work on family pets. He didn't he didn't do things that he had a morale. He, he had morales. Like he I don't know what's the word I'm looking. He he had a morality about him that. He understood taxidermy, but understanding taxidermy and doing it the right way doesn't mean that you can do a family pet the right way, right? And so in, in retrospect or in, in what I've always learned or what I learned from him is that there's nothing on the planet that we can't do when it comes to taxidermy. Um, he told me, and this is verbatim per John, the only four things I can't do is grandma, grandpa, the ex-wife, and the ex-husband. All that stuff's illegal. Other than that, he could do anything. I mean, he could literally do anything, but he kept himself at bay to what he wanted to do. And I think a lot of that came from working at the Smithsonian. Um, working at the Smith. You know, that guy designed and, and created their freeze dry system, which is still in use today, which Chris had talked about. It, it the, Talk about pioneering. I mean, that guy was a pioneer and it's still in use at the Smithsonian. To me personally, that it, there's nothing better as a tribute than having something like that. So for me, I have a... I have this system and I will bring it back and we will be continuing on his legacy. And just like that sign says back there, 
it will always be called gurney freeze-dried taxidermy. It will always be called that because you know what? I was lucky enough to learn from him for six years every Monday. For six years, I drove from Modesto to Watsonville, two hours there, sometimes two and a half, three hours back. It didn't matter to me. I don't care about that part. I cared about hanging out with that guy. That was the coolest guy I know as a taxidermist. Coolest guy. And um, he's a pioneer. He's a legend. Um, I've done, I've tried to do my due diligence and I'm a part of California Taxidermy Association. I've tried to do my due diligence to get him initiated into the California Hall of Fame of taxidermy. Now, don't get me wrong. When it comes to taxidermy, it's, he's not, he's the Barry Bonds, but he's not Barry Bonds, right? Let's all be <laughs> true about this. But when it comes to being inducted into the Hall of Fame of taxidermy, does it get any better? Like, I truly wish I could have done this while he was alive and he could have enjoyed the accolades. Unfortunately, he's not. And um, he's a good man. And that man gave me a chance to be what I'm, what I plan on being, and that's the the biggest and best taxidermist in the whole state of California. And without without him, I wouldn't be in this position. Literally, without him, I would not be in this position. But I am now. And I'm going to embrace it and I'm going to do whatever I can. So anybody watching this, if you ever need anything, please reach out. You know, I, I'm willing to do, it might take a while to get it back, but I'm willing to do the work. And there's nothing that, that's the great thing about John. He didn't turn a job down. He'd just look at it and be like, yeah, we can do that. I'd look at him and be like, how the hell are we going to do that, John? And he's like, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And we did. We always figured it out. I mean, six years of working with this guy, we figured it out every single time. And I, it, it never ceased to amaze me how ingenuitive he was. Like he, he's a taxidermist, but he was an engineer. He was a thought process kind of guy. Like if he could think it, and it could be done, he'd make it happen. Like literally make it happen. And I like to think from time to time that I'm pretty ingenuitive, you know, okay, well, we need to do this to make that. Nothing like that guy, <laughs> nothing, you know, like my, he writes his stuff down me. I'm just like, oh, well, let's see if this will work. Oh, wait, how did we do that last time? <laughs> so I guess in 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 the end and and in conclusion, John was my friend. He was a mentor to me. He was a close friend. I miss him a ton. I miss him a lot. Um, but sometimes the only way to not miss somebody is to keep them alive, and do what they taught you how to do. And I'm doing that. And so I miss him. But everything that I turn out that he showed me how to do, it's a piece of him. Every single time, it's a piece of him. And uh, I relish that. Like, I, I look forward to every everything that might put a stumbling block in front of me, <laughs> he would look at me and be like, oh no, we can figure that out. Like, don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, a lot of things that a lot of people don't know, and I'm, I'm just going to bring it up briefly, is he, he owned a, a 1906 White's steam car. Well, me being in the Navy and being an engineer, I had to, I had to learn the steam cycle. Well, it's the same thing on a big ship 
as it is a car. And I'm going to tell you, when I told him, like, oh, I know how this steam cycle works on this car, he looked at me like I, I was an alien because he was like, how do you know this? And you're, you're so young. And I'm like, what do you mean? How do I know this? Like, doesn't everybody know the steam cycle? <laughs> like, everybody knows the steam cycle. Apparently, not everybody knows the steam cycle. <laughs> but with that being said, the fact that I took an interest in his car and I knew what we were, like, it literally changed the retrospect of our relationship. He looked at me and he was like, dude, you actually know what I'm talking about. And him teaching me, I'm telling you, this system that I've got, it's in the back. And there's going to be a day here shortly that we're going to get it up and running. We did a whole bunch of cleaning today because I was so motivated. I was like, you know what? Guess what? We're cleaning the back shop out. We're going to start doing this. Like, we got to do this. We're doing this, you know? And I'm motivated. And I'm motivated to get this thing going because he deserves that. He deserves it. And I didn't spend five, six years at his shop every Monday to let it just sit in this back place. So we're going to bring this shop back up to par. We're going to put this system back together and we're going to get it running. And I'm going to tell you guys this, anybody that's listening to this, I have a feeling we're going to be the biggest taxidermy shop in four states, Oregon, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, California. We're going to be the biggest taxidermy shop in, in the states. And anybody that wants to come and learn, I am willing. If you're willing to put the time in, I'm willing to show you. So that's my spill. Thank you for listening to me. Chris, thank you for what you said. And uh, let's move it on to the family members <laughs> or the, the family friends. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Mitch. And um, I love what you said about, you know, celebrating him by keeping him alive. And I know that um, all of us are just so happy that Gurney's Freeze Dried Taxidermy is, is still, um, will still live on and that um, his practices are going to continue with you and that that amazing machine that Chris showed us is, still going to have many more decades of life in it. It's, um, it's pretty fantastic. So thank you so much for being here and for sharing these stories with us. And we're going to keep you around and we'll have some like Q&A time at the end um, and maybe get some more uh, details out of you. But I did want to welcome in also some, some dear personal friends of Mr. Gurney. We've got the Kodiga family here. Um, let me put you on special view. Um, so thank you all for, for being here and, um, and sharing some, some thoughts about Mr. Gurney. Well, I knew uh, John Gurney uh, going all the way back to his early days. I'm a little bit older than he was. But I can always remember that uh, in the younger days, he always had a butterfly net ch chasing butterflies. He just loved all animals and stuff. And um, he chose to, uh, to, to go into freeze dry taxidermy so that you didn't have to eviscerate the specimens. And that was, that was the first and the most important thing probably that he ever did uh, after, that after that point. And then when he got it to that point, he took freeze dry taxidermy to the very top, probably one of the, the most proficient freeze dry taxidermists in the entire world because he wound up at the end of the freeze dry with specimens that were really looking just like nature. And uh, John had an amazing intellect. Uh, had, first of all, he had a seven foot, no, a seven, seven inch, 7.8 inch skull size. He had plenty of room for brains and he used them. And, and uh, uh, he just, he, he's probably the foremost free dry taxi in the world or among them today and we should all be very proud of that because it's a profession and there's probably nobody else who wants to know that comes close to him i hope there's no competition out there that hears that and doesn't like it but anyway <laughs> it's, it's probably the fact uh, so we call him the gentle Jack, uh, giant and my family and, and his brother and john have fished in yellowstone for 50 some odd, odd years every 60. year together being with John's just an absolute treasure because he would develop uh, sounds 
for everything in, uh, in, uh, in nature's life to all kinds of things. I remember we used to go into grocery stores and you'd make it sound like a cricket or like a frog and these women would be standing at the lettuce case and jump back two inches. Cricket, cricket. <laughs> anyway, it is a marvelous man. He was, he was uh, never preferring himself to anybody else. He uh, uh, didn't really care about money. He was just your good friend, John. Uh, his nephews called him Unc, and so we all called him Unc too. He was our Unc as well, and uh, he was just—he was just a, a giving, free person who was probably one of the foremost free ride taxidermists in the world. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I love what you said about um, him making pieces that looked like nature. And that's so true. And that's one of the reasons why we all appreciate his work so much, especially for us uh, nature centers and museums that share natural history collections with the community. Um, that's what we're after. And you can't get any better than his pieces. So thanks for thanks for sharing that and um, for sharing your many, many, many years of friendship um, with yeah. Unk. We, um, had, we had a dog. He's a growl in his specimens. <laughs> you know, the They're dog, that real. I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we go into John's uh, uh, office there on East Lake Avenue, and, and uh, if there was uh, maybe like a, I don't know, a cat cat or something like that, the dog would go, you know, it was, it, he was, he was, he was wonderful. It's a shame that he's not here because he was truly one of the world's foremost free stride tattoos. Well, and um, that brings me to our, our next point, which is that, again, his work lives on. And so we have uh, our, my and Kathleen's museum, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, um, Chris with the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History. And then we're also joined um, by uh, Jonathan and Stephanie from the Watsonville Wetlands Watch, which is, you know, Mr. Gurney's local nature center organization, one of several actually in Watsonville. And so I wanted to um, welcome in Stephanie and Jonathan to share a little bit about um, how Mr. Gurney's work lives on through Watsonville Wetlands Watch. So I'm going to share my screen again for you guys. All right, take it away, Jonathan. Okay, thanks. Um, this has been such a wonderful evening. I, I feel really blessed to have had an opportunity to work with John um, and, and get to know him and, and visit the shop. And, and um, I just want to say, uh, Stephanie and I want to share a few words of how we've been able to use the taxidermy uh, as part of our conservation work. Uh, Watsonville Wetlands Watch is a nonprofit organization that does environmental restoration, conservation, and education um, in Watsonville. Um, and we work really closely with the city of Watsonville, um, who operates the uh, Nature Center, which was which is in Ramsey Park and is currently being rebuilt into a new uh, LEED certified Nature Center. Um, and we operate the Wetlands Educational Resource Center, the, uh, the Fitz Wetland Center at Pajaro Valley High School. Um, and both of our centers, the Nature Center and the Fitz Wetland Center, have are filled with the taxidermy work um, from freeze, uh, Gurney's free, freeze dry taxidermy. Um, like you saw the specimens behind Chris, um, they're just amazing from bats to all kinds of ducks to foxes, um, just a tremendous diversity. And I think one thing that I wanted to just share is that there's been this uh, revolution of appreciation of the Watsonville wetlands in our community um, over the past 20, 30 years. And one of the key ways that that's happened is really bringing people up close to nature. And the um, taxidermy specimens have been um, one of our lead ambassadors um, and have, it wouldn't be an understatement to say that they have um, been used for art and science for tens of thousands, over tens of thousands of local students in the Watsonville community over the last um, couple decades. And we wouldn't have been able to have such incredible ambassadors without um, uh, John's work. Um, one of the things that I think was really special about this relationship was the community aspect. Um, so there would be, uh, you know, anytime any one of our docents or volunteers would find a specimen, they would immediately put it in their freezer. Um, and we wouldn't always hear about it. We, but a um, couple months later, we'd get a call from John and said, we've got your Cooper's Hawk ready. And I had no idea that 
that someone had frozen it, dropped it off, either paid for it or, you know, and was ready for it to come to our um, center. Um, it was this really wonderful community spirit um, around collection and being able to preserve these amazing creatures and, and allow them to be conservation ambassadors and educators for local youth. Um, and he was just a really special person. I feel really fortunate to have had that that institution in Watsonville and be part of this conservation story um, and to be able to, um, you know, get to know him and his extreme lightness and positive energy and always giving his time um, to students, volunteers, docents and staff um, to help us understand his methods and share his, um, um, like others have mentioned, this like really true um, combination of art and science. So. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn to Stephanie to share a little bit about the uh, work with students. Thanks. Um, I first learned about taxidermy and, and seeing Mr. Gurney's work um, as an educator at the City of Watsonville's Nature Center. And for so many in our community, seeing the animals at the Nature Center, that's the first time they're learning about the critters that live in the wetlands. When I became an educator at Watsonville Wetlands Watch, I was so excited to see the taxidermy out of the plexiglass boxes and, you know, um, getting a chance to feel the fur of the fox or to touch the feathers of the bubblehead in, in the correct way. Um, but, you know, and getting to teach the students how to do that carefully as well. As I mentor students at PV High School through our Wetland Stewards Program, one of the first thing the interns learn is how to teach using inquiry. Um, and that's through talking about specimens and doing, you know, specimen talks that we have at the FITS um, Work Center. Next slide, please. Um, you know, we taking um, the critters to community events like World Wetlands Day and Earth Day, it's always been a draw for people to come visit our booth. And I can always count on somebody trying to offer me a lot of money to buy the specimen because <laughs> they're just so high quality and everybody was just like, I really want to take the bobcat home. It's, I can almost always count on someone doing that. Um, what I want to say is that the taxidermy animals um, have broken a lot of barriers in our community. A lot of people have overcome fears of the animals. Um, many gain gratitude and appreciation for our wetland critters. And even young students um, that we teach in the after school program, like the photos you're seeing, um, they aspire to get into this field of environmental education just by getting to learn more about, you know, their neighbors, the wetland critters that um, live here. Um, so the wonder of the wetlands for Watsonville Wetlands Watch begins with Mr. Gurney and the skills and the work that he does through taxidermy. So I'm, I'm really grateful and uh, he will be missed. Thanks. Stephanie, thank you so much for, for sharing how impactful the animals have been for your students. I relate to that so much with my work at the museum. And while I've had a few students cry <laughs> um, seeing a mountain lion or um, seeing an animal that's no longer alive, I think I agree that the vast majority of people just end up having more and more wonder about the natural world by being able to get up close with them. So thank you so much. I appreciate what you said. Um, and I wanted to take just a, a couple of minutes to also share a little bit about uh, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History's uh, relationship with taxidermy, past, present, and ongoing. Um, and for those of you who have been in the area for many years, many decades, um, I don't know if you if you remember the museum when it looked like this. You know, let us know in the chat. This is not what our exhibit halls look like now, but this is an example of, um, you know, some traditional, I don't know if you call it traditional, I know that we were talking about traditional taxidermy earlier, but um, a traditional form of kind of like the hunter's mount taxidermy and our museum actually um, has a history of displays um, like this, but uh, in recent years uh, and decades, we've moved towards a more uh, natural, model of showcasing the animals within their natural habitats. And our uh, exhibit is called Santa Cruz from Shoreline to Summit that features uh, the bulk of our uh, pieces by Mr. Gurney and that you walk through different habitats that exist within the Santa Cruz County region. Um, and we also take the time to 
talk about the art of taxidermy within that exhibit. And some of you may recognize this uh, other local taxidermist um, that we all uh, appreciate so much. And that's uh, Randy Morgan, who uh, performed taxidermy the more traditional way. One of the things I love about this badger, other than the fact that it's a badger, um, is that you can actually see some little elements if you look really closely uh, of its uh, armature within it, particularly that there's a piece of wire sticking out underneath uh, its tail, which is one of my favorite pieces. Um, and it's a wonderful badger. We love it. And we love sharing that the process behind these specimens that we have on display. And I'll share that I can always tell when I'm looking at a gurney specimen, even though I don't really know much about this. I just I, I wouldn't be surprised if when Kathleen shows me a list of which of our specimens were done by Mr. Gurney versus uh, done by other taxidermists. I, I bet you that they're almost always going to line up with my thoughts because his are so beautiful, just like Chris and Mitch and everyone has been sharing. They're really artful. And uh, my personal favorite is a flicker that we have on display. Uh, one other way that we communicate about taxidermy with the community is through uh, blogs, special exhibits, and webinar programs like this that Kathleen organizes, um, which are deep dives into the stories behind our collections. And she's written blogs like this one back in 2018. She continues to create uh, more and more content uh, where she talked about the process of freeze-dried taxidermy and featured Mr. Gurney. Um, we also share our uh, specimens with school groups that visit the museum and explore our galleries, as well as take specimens out into the community through our mobile museum program. And just like Stephanie so eloquently said, they are such a wonderful tool for sparking an interest in the natural world and feeling a connection. And, you know, who's to say how many wonderful um, moments have followed for those people as they've continued to explore their interest in natural history. And we've also done some things that are a little on the odd side too. Um, we have an annual Halloween event called Museum of the Macabre. And one of the years, the theme was taxidermy. And there is this element of taxidermy in contemporary society where people view it as an art form too. Um, and so we featured a local artist who um, does things a little bit differently with taxidermy for one of our events, as well as featuring students from the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History. We are so grateful for our ongoing partnership with Chris and his team up at UCSC. Um, there are wonderful students there who are going on to do amazing things. And one of the things that they have an opportunity to do at the Norris Center is to learn how to do taxidermy, maybe not the freeze-dried way, the traditional way. And we actually had some of the students do taxidermy in the middle of the museum for couple of our events, which has been fantastic. Um, and then Alex Crone, who used to work for the Norris Center, also gave a presentation about how to do taxidermy. So he, um, I think it was an acorn woodpecker um, that he demonstrated. And so we have a recording of that that I'll also share out. Um, so taxidermy lives on uh, through our institutions, and we're going to continue to um, to share Mr. Gurney's legacy with the community. And I want to uh, hand it over one more time to Chris, who's going to share a little bit more about how Mr. Gurney's legacy lives on. Is, is there a chance I can throw something in there? Yeah, go for it, Mitch. So I, I, I don't mean to interrupt Chris, I apologize. Uh, two things. So um, something that's really, really cool that John and I did that we were able to do together. Uh, Point Lobos, uh, Nature museum or nature right there down past monterey mm -hmm. uh is point lobos nature uh i don't know it you can go walk trails along the the beach yeah. and whatnot. anyways they brought me a pelican uh a, a brown pelican one day and they were like hey you know we don't we know that we can't actually taxidermy this because it's it's too old of a specimen but what john and i actually did was we did the wings and we we put the wings out and we put them on on handles so like people could walk up and stand on the the edge of a shoreline the edge of the shoreline there 
And as a pelican, you could literally <laughs> hold onto these wings with the handles and you can feel the lift. Like yeah. people, they don't, they're like, whoa, like I, this thing wants to take me away. And you're like, yeah, like that's, you know, that's how a bird flies. Yeah, that's the so cool, thing, that like practical application of taxidermy. Yeah, the like practical really application, and that's really what it came down to was the practical application. The other thing was Chris sent, or he he showed a, a, a photo, and you brought up the Halloween thing. He showed a photo with a young lady sitting in a chair in the front of, the, of John's office. Well, if you look over to the right, there's a, a full moon with a, uh, what do you call them? Uh, what a, uh, werewolf. Like a werewolf? Yeah. yeah. He made that. <laughs> he literally drew and made that all himself. And that was his Halloween decoration for the taxidermy <laughs> shop. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> so like, I'm sorry, I know it's a little weird, but like me seeing that picture and then looking at that, I was like, dude, I totally know that. Like he nice. did that whole thing by hand. Like he cut it out. He drew, he did the whole thing by hand. And so the day up until the day we closed that shop down, that was one of his favorite things he ever had. <laughs> and there were days that I was like, hey, John, what are you going to do with that? And, you know, fortunately for him, his family took it, took it. You know, they, they were like, yeah, we're going to hold on to this as it should be. You know, it should stay in the family. But let me tell you, seeing that picture with the young lady sitting in the chair and then looking over and seeing that darn werewolf in the, the the full moon that was amazing let's wrap this up bitch <laughs> yeah i'm sorry i didn't mean to go on yeah i'll so shut I, up i just want to say a couple last things and then we can have some questions and answers like one of the things that we've done to really celebrate gurney's contributions is have public events and this is just one picture from a particularly big one that maybe some of you came to in 2016, I think. Um, but we did many, and you can see we hung an owl above everybody, but there were, we put many displays up and we would often use students. They would, we would borrow John's specimens and make displays. So you can show the next, the next slide. This is just one example of two students. We borrowed a bunch of ducks and they were, these two students made a display that we made for a big open house and probably had like a thousand people come to this. Um, and you can just imagine many students making these displays and it was just really amazing to use such amazing specimens. So that's a combination of our specimens and gurneys um, there on that, on that display. And then here's a couple, one more slide is a couple other pictures. Um, of just some displays we had and people looking at displays. And then there's one more. And then uh, we can just flip to the last slide here. And this is a picture we got of John at one, one of our big events. We had a big reception and he came all dressed up and he was so fun to have. Uh, there and he was so chatty and loved talking to people and it was just so wonderful to see everybody talking to him and him just having such a great time telling them about how he made these specimens and i just want to quickly say just at the end here what this event meant for me was a, a bunch of themes kind of came out of it that are just so important to me and i think i could say this for the community like our love of nature is common ground for all of us. Um, like so many different people come to these specimens from so many different backgrounds and they're just in awe of them. And it's just really cool that we have this mutual love of nature that can bring us together. Um, it's not often you get the chance to visit, to actually meet an inventor or be in the presence of someone who actually invented something new. No one taught him how to do all these things. Um, and I just feel so fortunate to have crossed paths with somebody. You know, you think about like all these things that have been created in humanity. Someone had the original idea. This man, John, had so many of them about freeze-dry taxidermy. No one else did. Um, there are brilliant people everywhere, and it's just so it's just so warm. It just makes me feel just so part of a community to, to 
reach out and see that there's brilliant people all over the place, not just up here at the university, you know, but everywhere. And um, I just treasure the fact that we got to reach out and, and meet the brilliance of John. Um, and I'm going to miss him a lot, as everybody said. Um, and we got a chance to celebrate him and learn from him and and pass on some of his skills. So I, in some ways, I think like, what else can we do? <laughs> um, that's we we covered a lot of it, and I just appreciate the whole community for appreciating him. So, thanks to you all for being here, and thanks to everyone for organizing this, Marisa. And um, we can take questions. Yeah, um, I'm. There's so many. There's mostly just like really lovely comments in the chat here and just stories. And so I am certainly saving the chat so that we can um, spend time pouring all over all of these. Um, and, but if you do have any more questions for Chris or for Mitch, drop them in the chat. I know that someone um, was curious, well, I don't know if it got answered, but what's, does anyone know what's gonna happen to um, the building where Mr. Gurney's shop was? Yeah, uh, the the building itself, um, the the gentleman that owned the building, <laughs> I I should say, you know, this was all done back on a handshake, back in the day, and so John, his rent was four hundred dollars a month on that building, um, up until the day we moved out, and um, that's unheard of, you know. With that being said, it was all in a handshake with. The two there's two sons that own the car wash next door. Um, those two young men, which are I, and when I say young men, they're my age. I'm 46, so I'm just trying to reach out. But uh, those young men, they're actually going to use that as a a shop. They're going to use that as a um, a facility that they can run their businesses they uh, apparently they own more than one property and so that's going to be kind of like their their man cave business you know um you know there was a point in time with that building that i i climbed up on the roof and i tried to save the gurney freeze dry taxidermy sign and it, it just started falling apart um and so i left it there and so I don't want anybody to think that I didn't do my due diligence. I promise if you go, if you <laughs> drive by and you see it, you're going to see where I tried to pry it <laughs> off and it just started to fall apart. And I was like, oh, geez, cool. like I'm not doing this any honor. But you can see that I got the real deal sign of his and it's sitting right there. And um, that's all that needs to be known is his, his work will live on through me. Yeah. And uh, and Mitch, you have a your through original me, through me and Chris and anybody that wants to send somebody over to learn, I'm willing to teach. So, and your um your business is First Impressions Taxidermy, but you've also incorporated Gurney's Freeze Dried Taxidermy, so you you're Correct. both of them now. Yes, um, and I'll so be first sharing. Yeah, First Impressions is the traditional taxidermy. Um, it'll always, my freeze dry taxidermy business will always be called gurney freeze dry tax. It'll never change. Um, mm -hmm. it'll still be under free, you know, first impressions, but it'll, it'll always be gurney freeze dry taxidermy. So, and I'll include, um, some contact information for Mitch and a follow-up email, which will also include the recording of tonight's presentation and some other resources. Um, and you'll get that in, in within a couple of days, um, in your inbox. Um, yes. And uh, Chris, do you have any questions for Mitch that you have wanted to ask? Hey, you know, I, got, I still got the butterfly net that Chris was talking about. Uh, you can catch butterflies with this thing. Cool. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think if I have a, a particular question that, um, yeah, I don't know if people want to Chris. Awesome. You're the man, dude. Between you and Marissa, you guys are awesome. <laughs> like everybody that's a part of this and has has added to this this evening is amazing. But Chris and Marissa are the ones that we should really applaud because these everybody. these two folks are they're really the ones that have brought 
John's John's legacy to to what it is now. You know what we're talking about. So uh, yeah, it's really I, cool I, in this I, in this region that we have so many organizations that are sharing uh, natural history and the wonders of the natural world with the community. And so it's been really special to um, to be able to partner up with these orgs and there are others out there too. I saw in the comments, like there's someone who works at San Lorenzo Valley High School, I think, um, who was saying that they have specimens that are from Mr. Gurney's lab. Um, just the the impact is, uh, you know, hard to say, although we do have, there's like a, there's a ledger that, um, that Mitch has, that has, I think this one ledger that he pulled out, it has um, taxidermy records from like 1991 to, to present um, and we're gonna continue to talk to, sorry, I'm like all blurry for some reason now. Um, we're gonna continue to talk to Mitch about um, uh, making sure that records of, of uh, Mr. Gurney's work um, live on for the community because he, he has been just such an important part of, um, I'm sorry, I don't know <laughs> how to make myself not blurry, um, <laughs> of, uh, of what all of our organizations are, are able to do. Um, <coughs> So we're, we're grateful for you, Mitch, and grateful to connect with you. And uh, I guess I'll just uh, say that I, you know, thanks to everyone who's joined us today too and shared your many stories. Like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to save the chat because there's a lot of good stories in there. I couldn't read them all. Um, but does uh, anyone have any other parting words that you want to say before we let people off the hook for the evening? Kathleen or Jonathan or Stephanie or the Kodagas? I think there was a question from someone named Stuart. I don't know if we can reach out to them or a raised hand. Stuart, Stuart, what's going on? I don't see Stuart in the um, in the attendees anymore. So. Must have been a while ago. But all right, any any final words? For me, thank goodness for tech. Uh, you know, technology. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. I'll oh, and say, I did see, oh, I'm sorry. I just uh, saw Stuart's um, question in the Q&A. He said, do you, Mitch, do you require uh, to see a hunter's tag before you accept any particular specimens? Yes, always. Okay. <laughs> All right, Chris, sorry to interrupt. Oh, I was just going to say, feel free to reach out to any one of our places and come see the specimens if you haven't seen them. Um, they really are striking to look at up close and spend some time. With. It's and I'm happy to get them out and, you know, get you up and close to them. So, <laughs> like, like boys, I'm sure the museum and, and us would love to have folks come out and really get a close up look. So, if you're in Watsonville and you haven't had a chance to come on by the Wetland Center um, or the New Nature Center when it's open and, and check out all these amazing um, works of art. Absolutely. And you can see um, you out in the, in the community too. Watsonville Wetlands watches constantly at like every community event sharing specimens. So, great. And I'm and sorry, Mitch, what were you doing? wants to come by my shop is more than welcome. It's in Modesto. It's a ways, but you're well, more than welcome to come over. We'll make a field trip. And one of my, one of my colleagues at the university asked if we could bring some interns. And I think- Gosh darn right. Yeah, we'll bring some. <laughs> And I then, need all um, the help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just want to see if um, any of the Coda guys have any last things that you want to say. Yeah, we just like to, as our family we and the community, we just like to thank all of you for putting this together. It's really wonderful. John was such an amazing person. He was like a surrogate uncle for me. I called him Monk, even though he wasn't my uncle. Everybody and, uh, called him Monk. Any, anybody, anybody that knew him, was he was just a beautiful person. He put everybody first. He was uh, someone uh, obviously in taxidermy, but in life that we could all learn from and really a beautiful person. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to have spent so much time with him, especially in Yellowstone, Montana and Idaho fishing. He taught me how to fly fish and what an amazing guy. And, and my folks here, they have a tarpon, they got a coyote, we've got a pheasant, we've got all <laughs> kinds of ducks, we've got rattlesnakes, we've got all kinds of things. All of our houses have fish. <laughs> anyway, we're, we we primarily uh, catch and release, but once in a while you gotta you gotta you gotta keep the big one and uh, it's, preserve it. And John did such a wonderful job, and the eyes that he did, he took photos and and put them in there. And um, 
anyway, as a family, we just wanted to thank you all for taking the time. And uh, it's really a wonderful tribute to somebody that definitely uh, deserves recognition. No, be honest honest about we that, should be Mark. thanking you. Thank you. We should be thanking you guys. You, you guys are true, true relatives of somebody that you know knew him intimately no different than myself and chris and whatnot but you know you knew him as unk and there's a there's a not a lot of people that knew him that way so it, thank it's you for carrying the torch mitch <laughs> yeah thank and you we're very much, you guys we're um we're just really happy that we were able to um as people have said like have this tribute for mr gurney um he has been just so obviously very important to so many people and um, it's important that that we do this and we'll continue to uh, to think of him often. Um, and thank you all for sharing your thoughts and hope you all have a wonderful night. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. It was nice Bye -bye. to meet you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>